All right, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Deborah Hurd. I am the project coordinator for the 50th anniversary of the Department of Black Studies here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The department was established in 1971, following two years of demands and student protests, culminating the arrest of the Omaha 54. 54 UNO students who were arrested for sitting in at the chancellor's office on November 10th, 1969. As a result of their efforts, the support of other students and student groups, but also the mobilization of the black community in Omaha, civic and social organizations, churches, and just regular people, this department exists. And because of their continued support, this department continues to exist. We acknowledge that this university sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people whose name was given to this city, the Omaha, and of the other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. In the spirit of the Omaha 54, the students at San Francisco State University who formed the first African American Studies Department in this country, and those that preceded them, students in Greensboro, South Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, and Birmingham, Alabama, students who sat in and sparked movements for change. We stand in solidarity and support of the students at Howard University, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, and Spelman College, who right now are sitting in, standing up, and speaking out, demanding change. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Katherine Adams. Dr. Adams is an Associate Professor of African American Studies at Claflin University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Dr. Adams earned a bachelor's degree in English from Johnson C. Smith University, a master's in African American Studies from Temple University, and a PhD in African American Studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And since she just sent me her bio, because all of that other stuff I already knew, I'll read the other things that she would like you to know. Uh, her research interests include Africana literary history, Africana-based pedagogy and curriculum development, Africana science fiction, speculative fiction, and Afrofuturism, digital humanities, and freedom and marinage narratives. She is the daughter of two HBCU alumni and former teachers in Philadelphia public schools, Catherine A. and the late Shepard B. Adams. And one of the objectives of this webinar is to show the great diversity within a discipline of Black, African-American, Africana, Pan-African, African diaspora, and global African diaspora studies. The different kinds of research that its scholars are undertaking and how this benefits the Black community. So thank you, Dr. Adams, for agreeing to come and share your work with us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about being here. Um, Deb, you know, you and I, have, we go way, way back. We have many, many stories um, to tell, but I definitely think of you as a kind of sister warrior in this struggle uh, around liberation for African people and certainly to bring uh, just greater awareness to those narratives of struggle and um, and hopefully maybe some of these young people that are joining us today will be part of that generation that will actually not repeat the same things over and over again. <laughs> and, and we may actually make uh, make some great headway. So thank you very much for having me. And, and so I, I would like to add, because there are a lot of Claflin students and hopefully we have some UNO students, uh, Dr. Adams is the kind of person that you want to make friends with when, when, when you're in college or in graduate school, along the road, you want to run into somebody like Dr. Adams. I, I call Dr. Adams my, my, my roadie because Dr. Adams, if I need to write, if you know, and I write my dissertation and I'll say, I'm stuck. Can you come spend a weekend with me and let's write. And she won't do that. 
So she has traveled to Chicago on more than one occasion to, to go to the library with me to write. Uh, when we were at Temple, we would do all-nighters uh, at the library or in my apartment uh, for a yeah. whole weekend. So she is the type of person that you, the, the type of person that you really want to have as a very good friend because uh, only a good friend would do that for you. <laughs> and COVID is making me mad <laughs> because I would be hopping on a plane. <laughs> yes. If it were not for COVID. <laughs> so before I turn it over to you, uh, I want to start off by asking you a few questions and then that can lead us into your presentation. Uh, so how did you get into African-American studies? You know, um, I would have to say that I would credit Johnson C. Smith. Before I went to that historically black college in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, I was surrounded by, I think, uh, lots of books in my home. My parents were teachers. But I remember reading a poem by Langston Hughes, and it stood out to me, this was when I was in high school, that it was different. And reflecting back, I know it was different because everybody else we were reading in school was white. <laughs> so I had that poem in my head. I memorized that poem. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. And it stuck in my head, but when I get to college, I wanna be a business major, um, you know, I wanna go into corporate America or corporate law. And I start taking classes in the English department so that my writing is strong. And I encounter Zora Neale Hurston and their eyes are watching God. And I remember writing in my journal, like I was crying and I didn't know if I was crying for the characters and what was going on in the story, if I was crying for myself because I didn't know black people could write like that. And, um, you know, some mishaps, um, I took the, I was out of sequence with my business courses. So I started taking more and more English classes and we had the benefit of having a, har a class on the Harlem Renaissance, a class on images of Black women um, in uh, African-American literature, and, um, and just lots of other things that sent me on a journey that led to Temple uh, and then led to the University of Massachusetts. What are some of your other research interests or projects? Because you're going to be talking about your dissertation research. But what are some of the other projects or, or just research interests that you have? Well, certainly everywhere I go, I try to find something that is organic to that place where I am. And so when I was at Payne College in Augusta, Georgia, someone said to me the first semester I was there, you know, we should be doing something on Frank Yerby. And I was like, I better find out who Frank Yerby is. <laughs> and then he graduated from, uh, from Payne College. Uh, in the late 1930s, and was one of the most prolific uh, Black novelists, uh, penned more than 30 novels, but not all of his novels, most of his novels um, did not have main characters who were Black. And so a lot of people, you know, labeled him as, you know, sell out. They wanted his uh, work to be more revolutionary. And, um, and I just decided that I would let my students decide for themselves who Frank Yerby was. Um, he was somebody that worked, walked the same campus they walked. And we ended up generating such a buzz with students presenting at conferences. We visited Boston and Fisk University where he has um, papers uh, and uh, materials in their archival uh, collections. And um, there was a, uh, a professor, Auburn, who put out a call for book chapters uh, to pull it together, to pull people writing about Yerby together, because I think my students were causing such a stir that people were trying to figure out, like, what do I know? 
Um, why don't and, I? And your know? students were undergraduate students, right? And my students were undergraduate students. Um, I think that's probably the the beauty of being at uh, you know small liberal arts colleges. Um, it's the experience I had at Johnson C. Smith where there were always people that were um, encouraging me to do research, um, giving me opportunities to present that research. And, um, and so I tried to do the very same thing. And, um, and so we caused quite a buzz. The book on Yerby came out last year. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, two years ago. Hmm. No, it came out last year during COVID because we were doing book events <laughs> on Zoom. And um, and so uh, a lot of, you know, the chapter that I write is about researching with my students and them finding new meaning instead of just kind of adopting what other people had to say about Yerby. Um, I think since my time in South Carolina, been doing a lot of work around oral histories and what I have started thinking about them as these um, high stories um, that I am through the African-American oral history course that's cross-listed in history and African and African-American studies, getting young people to kind of sit at the feet of elders and ask them questions and it has just been amazing to see what the result of those interviews are. That uh, I have some students in my classes who spend a lot of time with their grandparents, but they're asking different questions and they are getting some really rich information that I think is not only going to be beneficial for individual students, but we are in the process of putting together a internet-based archival site so that people can search those interviews that students are doing. Um, they may be able to vote, uh, uh, search them based on um, voting rights or based on African-American family, uh, just a, a wealth of topics that we cover every year and then students go out and ask their grandparents um, some critical questions. And, uh, and I think considering the fact that, you know, people are leaving us, they're making their transition, that we can't really wait, um, that we should get the stories that we can get um, as, as soon as possible. And then you can add to those stories, <laughs> you know? So it's like, if someone is, if they, you know, if they hang in there and they're still with us 10 more years later, then you have those gems and you can, can add to those questions that you want to ask. But, um, but I am encouraging um, students encouraging everybody. Um, sometimes I talk to some of my friends and they're like, oh, I'm in Florida visiting my, you know, my parents, my grandparents. I'm like, I have eight questions I'd like for you to ask them. <laughs> and again, um, people saying, oh my goodness, I had no idea that I thought we were from this place, but I found out. So these are some critical conversations that we need to have. And, um, and I'm just glad to be one of those people that is involved in people making those connections, they're going to help us tell better stories about who we were and who we want to be. So that, that's an excellent way to kind of transition into your presentation. Um, the last question that I have, and, and I'll turn my video off and turn it over to you, is to ask you, um, how is it that you decided on this particular topic for your dissertation? Hmm. This was not an easy road. Um, <laughs> I mentioned Zora Neale Hurston and Their Eyes Are Watching God. And that was a pivotal text for me. I was fascinated with Eatonville. And, um, and I thought of this idea of the all black town where black people are governing themselves. But there's something about Eatonville that if you read the lines very closely, that they actually are working somewhere else. And so there is a part of their lives that they're not as in control of. Um, and so I kept thinking, you know, I like the idea of Eatonville, but Eatonville is not really sovereign. 
But I went off to graduate school thinking, um, where are those sovereign spaces? What do they look like? Um, certainly in terms of the historical record, we know that um, Haiti and the Haitian revolution is that, um, that uh, pivotal ground zero site for the idea of um, revolution, of that um, uh, overthrowing of oppression and the ending of enslavement, and I was looking for some of those models in literature because I do a lot of my work in terms of um, cultural forms and, and poetry and, and novels. And, um, and I was piecing together a few novels that I thought I might look at. And then someone mentioned to me about some novels that come out around um, Oklahoma. And I never thought about Black people being in Oklahoma. And, um, and so that sent me on this journey uh, of the dissertation that was titled Africanizing the Territory. And that, um, that idea of how, um, how Black people start getting, um, thinking about Oklahoma, how they get there. And, uh, and certainly is something that historians of that uh, that frontier are aware of, the descendants of the people who are um, in that area, they know their history, but it's not widely um, known as it should be. And then also for today, uh, I'm so glad, uh, Deb, that you had me thinking about these ways in which we can connect uh, a lot of these kind of frontier stories and identities in a way that isn't typically done. Um, I think that this year I've probably heard more of my students talk about Black Wall Street, which I think is, um, I think that's certainly a step in the right direction. But Tulsa, um, much like when I was discovering Eatonville, uh, is not sovereign. Um, it and and so there are some vulnerabilities there that um, that certainly um, just kind of give us reason to kind of reflect on that unique history um, that is there. So I want to talk this evening about Africanizing the Great Plains. And, uh, and I have here on this title slide, you will see this way in which uh, just thinking about this area of the country that oftentimes does not get treated. We talk about the Great Migration, we move up the, uh, the Northeast and sometimes as far over to Chicago, but this area that is west of the Mississippi, sometimes we skip over it and get to California. Um, but uh, but this is an area that doesn't often get get talked about, except for um, by the people who have family um, or who have spent time in in um, in this area. So I'm going to just uh, talk about some definitions and um, and some African descendants on the Great Plains and these this idea of frontier identities. Uh, a little bit about Black sovereignty and this idea of Black reimagination. And, uh, and then we'll wrap up and, um, and definitely get to some questions. I have a very lengthy quote here on this slide, but I wanted to begin with it because this is from Aikwe Armaz, The Eloquence of Scribes, and it really does sum up the way in which I look at my work. Uh, and so I'm gonna read this quote and, um, and really just have it set the tone for how I'm thinking about, uh, about this, this larger project. So he says, before the traumatic massacre, so callously called the slave trade, the victims lived in a society with a history the erasure of that history so that a group of persons could be fabricated 
whose social biography would always begin with the trauma of their reduction to slavery, that erasure is a falsification of reality. An undistorted approach would be to acknowledge the, enorm the enormity of the traumatizing crime, but beyond that, to set it within the flow of a social history reaching back centuries and millennia before the trauma. This would make the group not simply and inaccurately just descendants of slaves, but members of human groups that for millennia were part of African society who were subjected to attacks designed to strip them of their humanity and who are now working out a way self-defined against lynchings and assassinations, deliberate neglect and continued stigma, uh, stigma, mm, stigmatization into the future. So that kind of says it all about the way in which I think about our long genealogy that again stretches back millennia. Um, certainly the work of, of, of Deborah Hurd speaks to that and then also into the future. And so um, my, uh, my fascination with, um, with Afrofuturism and, um, and, and how we can depict an African future. I see all of that in this work. So now I wanna start with the question of what does it mean to Africanize a place? And oftentimes um, one might think that to Africanize something that that would emanate from somebody of African descent. But one of the earliest references that I found just going through some of the, um, uh, the archives and some of the territorial newspapers, I came across this document that is in reference to the second constitution that was being proposed for Kansas when Kansas was still a territory and it was vying for statehood. And you have this uh, uh, doctor and politician Calvin Chaffee, who puts into a document, um, actually calls the document, this attempt to Africanize the territories. And in this second um, constitution, uh, proposed constitution, he is um, kind of railing against the fact that um, there are people who want Kansas to enter as a pro-slavery state. And we want to be clear that while he is not, uh, he is not for uh, slavery being legalized in what would be the new state of Kansas, um, he is more for the idea of free labor and for it being a place where white men can um, kind of make their money unfettered and not have to be in competition with things uh, like slavery that would depress wages and earning potential. So just wanna be clear that while he is not for slavery, um, he is for the particular advancement of white, uh, of white people in a way that, um, similar aims, but he's using that term in, uh, to Africanize as this way of saying, um, we don't want this black presence um, to be legalized in this way that is going to be a disruption for, uh, for economic gain. And then we have here, uh, this is Edward McC uh, McCabe. He's actually gonna come up again a little later in the presentation, but the second place where uh, this idea of Africanizing comes up is in a territorial uh, newspaper. And this is quoted from a book written by um, Murray Wicket. And again, this reference to the black presence, and this is not necessarily around um, a pro-slavery or free state argument. This is um, 
this is in 1890. And so it is the um, articulation of trying to maintain Oklahoma as a place for white men and not and to depress this idea of black migration uh, to what is then the territory, uh, the Indian and um, Oklahoma territories that very shortly in 1907 will um, become uh, a state in the union. So for me, when I'm using the term, what does it, uh, when I'm using the term Africanized, I'm thinking about uh, some of the work that I do in my classes and what is showing up in my own writing that is very much connected to the conceptual categories of Africana studies that are um, used all the time by Greg Carr at Howard University. And so I'm thinking about this way in which we can um, op operationalize in movement and in memory sovereign spaces where people of African descent can be self-determining. I'm also thinking about an intentional separation from existing social structures. And this is in um, both in literature and in lived experience. And so this separation uh, from plantation capitalism, imperialism, settler colonialism, and in, in attempts to construct new models of freedom that are not a mimicking of what they see around them, but actually um, in some cases based on experiences or ideas of indigenous African models. Um, in some ways it may be mixtures of uh, African models, Native American models, and, and then also what is experienced here uh, in terms of what they see uh, in terms of the structures that are run by, um, by white people. And, um, and then how are they thinking about those things very differently? I think that oftentimes when we use terms like freedom, um, sometimes we think that we are all expressing that concept in the same way. And I would suggest that, um, that there's something about a kind of um, ancestral memory that is passed down in a variety of ways that is separate and distinct that, um, that can get grafted or married or um, incorporated, but it also but it also has some roots that uh, predate the experience in this Western Hemisphere. And then, lastly, just the idea of infusing Pan Africanism as a geopolitical view and a global strategy into anti-Black and anti-African freedom struggles, and so that's what I mean when I am thinking about to Africanize. Uh, Africanize a place. And so in thinking about these frontier identities, I want to be very intentional when I am reading that I am not just drawing a or painting with a broad brushstroke um, these people who are coming into this frontier space. It is um, uh, in many cases difficult land, like difficult to work. Uh, difficult to get it started. And, um, and so I'm thinking about them in my reading of historical narratives as well as fictional narratives. I'm thinking about them as migrants. I also refer to them as immigrants. Um, if it is before the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, I am thinking about whether they are free or enslaved, I'm thinking about them as homesteaders. I'm thinking about them as laborers, as professionals, and as political figures. And so if I can just say a little bit about the dissertation uh, in terms of Africanizing the territory, this is 
a history that predates statehood. And so that's why I make the reference to the territory and statehood comes in 1907 in Oklahoma. And there are these two waves that happen that help to kind of Africanize the territory. The first wave is along the Trail of Tears and that begins in the 1830s. And um, we often hear about the Trail of Tears, but we don't hear about that African presence as um, those Native American nations are being pushed out of the American South and out West. And then the second wave is the opening of Indian lands for homesteading in the late 1880s. And, um, and again, it's the opening of land, but it is the further pushing of Native American people um, out further West um, and some very um, just uh, duplicitous ways um, in which if you are going through the literature and going through the literature, I'm constantly seeing these ways in which uh, Native American nations and people are trying to figure out what is the best way to negotiate um, with a very aggressive uh, U.S. government that is uh, moving them around whenever they see fit to, um, to expand, um, to pursue the idea of manifest destiny. And, um, and so those are some of the things that are coming up even as we uh, are talking about some of these uh, people of African descent that are oftentimes um, overlooked. So in that first wave of uh, uh, the Trail of Tears, here are a couple of quotations that come from Quintard Taylor's work on, um, oops, sorry, uh, from uh, this title, In Search of the Racial Frontier. And he is looking at basically west of the Mississippi, uh, all the way out to California um, from 1528 to 1990. And some of these quotations are some of the things that I kind of wrestle with because oftentimes um, there are a lot of people that, um, especially in South Carolina, that will say, you know, well, my great, great grandmother or father was part Cherokee. And in the back of my mind, I'm always wondering, was, was that the result of a um, enslavement relationship? And most people don't know and they don't think to ask, but if it were um, a Scotsman or a German, then they would uh, know a little bit more about that history. And, um, and I'm always thinking, um, because these five Native American nations, um, as Taylor says, out of um, at least 500, were the only ones that actually um, held people of African descent in slavery. And, um, and so it's a very complicated relationship. And I think that um, on, the, uh, on the opposite side, I have to think about ways in which people of African descent were used as a weapon or as tools to clear those lands that belong to Native American people. So we have a very complicated history that oftentimes gets seen as like this alternative to um, having white ancestry but never really explored in, um, in ways, uh, I shouldn't say never, but oftentimes doesn't get, um, get explored in a way that would give us uh, some uh, better understanding of not only the past, but also how we might move um, in terms of allyship, in terms of resolution, with Native American people, even here in the present and then in the future. 
Now, I've also provided just um, statistics. Let me just say that um, uh, I always am mindful that they are um, just a, a starting point. I'll say a starting point because we know as with even the census today that there are oftentimes people who don't get counted um, and certainly with the categories that we um, have of census past that, um, that they can be very problematic, but they do show us trends. And so I wanted to highlight some of the numbers that show up in the historical narratives. This one in particular, I actually took this from Quintar Taylor's um, book, the one that I mentioned before, In Search of the Racial Frontier, uh, because there are um, not any uh, good census records for people of African descent uh, as far back as 1860. But uh, Quintar Taylor has this particular chart in his book. And I am going to, for the next few slides that actually have numbers on it, kind of highlight this comparison between here in 1860 is Indian territory, which will become the state of Oklahoma. And, um, and also Kansas, which is where we start to think about black migration in a, as part of maybe a more national conversation. And, um, and we refer to that migratory pattern to Kansas as um, the exodusters, but then we could also extend that out um, to the Great Plains uh, in a larger sense. Uh, those exodusters who are leaving the South, who are leaving um, opportunities that they thought they might find in the Northeast uh, or in the Midwest, but out to go even further West uh, to see if they can uh, make a, a better life. And, uh, and then also comparing it to Nebraska. And so that we will see uh, see those numbers. This is what the population of white people in this first category looks like for those three places. And then in this uh, middle category, this is what it looks like in terms of um, people of African descent. And we can see here uh, again, the really high numbers that are in Indian territory um, because of those five Native American nations, which actually had um, uh, only, they were only second to Texas in terms of um, how many enslaved people they had um, in uh, or um, working their land and in relationship to um, some of them had tributary relationships so that they did not have to work on the land, but they actually had to um, provide some kind of tribute because they were um, the property of, um, uh, in, the in that case, the Seminole um, uh, uh, nation uh, or native people. So we can see these low numbers in some of these other places in 1860. Then we get the second wave of black migration in terms of post reconstruction. There are high hopes in the American South as we get these reconstruction acts and the Freedmen's Bureau, but it all starts to fall apart um, in uh, 1877. And we get this great migration, certainly in uh, mass of more than 1 million Black migrants to places that are um, Northern states and these Northwest uh, uh, urban centers, which all actually kind of obscures <laughs> some of the other numbers. And um, 
this is why I think we still have more work to do. But I think it certainly helps that now that Nell Irving Painter wrote her book on the Kansas Exodusters movement, where she is chronicling that movement of 40,000 plus Black migrants. And, um, and so I think that 40,000 is still a significant number of people who are deciding with their feet that they uh, want a better life and that they are willing to, uh, to carve it out for themselves. And so we get the founding of Nicodemus and, um, and we also get some, um, some other ways in which they um, build black communities and enclaves. And then what I was able to argue, because I tried to uh, initially pitch that I wanted to talk about the all black town movement in the Oklahoma and Indian territories, where at least 100,000 black migrants uh, moved into that uh, into that area with the hopes of turning Oklahoma or turning those territories into an all black state. Uh, and initially I was met with some resistance. They were just like, but the great migration has so many people. I'm like, but no, Irving Panda got a whole book out of 40,000 plus black migrants. Certainly I can write a dissertation off of, you know, double that number um, and then some. And, um, and so just some interesting conversations. And what I also found in the initial conversations around this work is that a lot of times when people reference um, Black migration to the frontier, they automatically assume Kansas, even when Kansas wasn't at, at play. So um, the best example I can give is Toni Morrison's Paradise. She sets her novel um, in Oklahoma. She references things like Tulsa. And, um, and while she has um, fictitious names, it is very clear that it is Oklahoma. And um, when I was talking with this, uh, talking with literary scholars, uh, someone showed me an article where someone was like, oh, and, you know, Toni Morrison has just come out with a novel on Kansas. And I was like, that's not Kansas. So I was able to make the argument that um, that more work needed to be done around Oklahoma, that actually people moved in mass and they didn't um, they didn't just come to those territories, but they actually formed all black towns. And depending on how you count them. Um, that there were at least 30 uh, to 50 enclaves, towns, and settlements more than any other state in the United States. So here is just a graphic that um, I found really interesting. I wanted to include it because it actually has a, a relatively new addition um, this particular town, um, it, it existed, uh, so it goes back to maybe as far back as 1890, but it wasn't incorporated until 2001, and, um, and it is, um, it is a, a, a Black freedmen's town, and, um, and so you can just kind of see the ones that are in red are the ones that are um, that are still incorporated today. And there are some other places that are not um, named here, but you can get the idea of all of these Black people who are not just coming to the state to um, infuse themselves into the existing structures, but to build something that is of their own making. And so um, here I have, um, this is a little clip. We were testing, we were trying to listen to the, um, the audio and I'm not sure how clear it will play, but I really just want us to look at the pictures because um, sometimes I think it's really important to see um, you know, what these, 
like self-determining, I'm going to pack up and move to a place and that I have no family, you know, I've only heard of word um, and, um, and then I'm going to try to make a way uh, for my family. And, um, and so I want to I want us to kind of take a look at this picture. And also, I think that there should be um, like more of these little quick YouTube clips that uh, that students kind of put together, especially after doing some reading that um, I want to encourage people to create more of this content so that people, when they're searching for them, can see uh, some of these images and, and hear these stories and hear how people are connecting to this uh, to this information. So we're gonna just listen. It, it only lasts about two minutes and some change. Benjamin Pap Singleton was born a slave in Nashville in 18- Oh, hold on, let's see. Okay. He escaped to Canada and later settled in Detroit, where he ran a secret boarding house for fugitive slaves. At the end of the Civil War, he returned to Edgefield, where he became the founding member of the Exodusters. was the name given to the first mass migration of blacks from southern states after the Civil War. After forming the Edgefield Real Estate and Homestead Association, he helped lead over 20,000 migrants to Kansas. After forming the Edgefield Real Estate... Okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Black migration. Okay, I got it. It's, it. I'm joined now by Steve Schmidt, a veteran political strategist, oh. who advised the Bush campaign, led McCain's 2012 campaign, but has now left the Republican Party. Uh, good to see you and have you back, hold sir. Hold on one moment. Good to see you, Ari. How are you? Okay, sorry about that options on um, his working theory though that he shared with us is that he thinks bannon will ultimately blink if there is credible threat of jail your view of that comment from him uh, and the import of tonight's vote okay hold on one moment um i okay all right sorry about that um i was trying to i had i think that it was running in the background but i just wanted you all to see the images um of some of the people and um and what that kind of um uh what those settlements look like uh as they were moving there so again let's get back to a couple of um uh pages that are now including the census information from 1910 and there are some reports that are that come out of this census that make comparisons to 1900 that make this um kind of important to take a look at because for me i'm thinking about oklahoma um in 1900 we're still talking about territories by 1910 it is a state and so uh this particular slide lets us know that all total we are this is the population that has been counted for the united states um, we're talking about 91, about 92 million people in the country. And you can see the breakdown and that um, that people of African descent are um, roughly 9.8 million people. Um, and then you'll see that the white population as counted is 81 million people, right? So I just want you to think about that number, 9.8 million people, and um, and that 9.8 million people being roughly 10%, almost 11% of the population. So here is a map of 1910 and you get a um, opportunity to kind of see the density of people of African descent that uh, this is this would be the black belt that we know across the southern states and um, and then we see this concentration up through the northeast and um, and then when we get west of the Mississippi we can see in terms of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. 
And then just to um, kind of bring us back to thinking about the planes, I did a just a little bit of an overlay so that you could see the density um, that we're talking about and then also get some point of reference for some of the major cities that we would be um, thinking about in terms of uh, along the Great Plains. We think about Oklahoma City and Tulsa. In Kansas, you have Wichita, you have Omaha and Lincoln in Nebraska. Um, and uh, just to get a sense of what that density looks like. You can see here that for people of African descent, that end up going to Kansas, that they um, really do kind of spread out, even though uh, in terms of actually incorporating a town, um, they are um, mostly concentrated in Nicodemus for the incorporation of a town, but they are, um, but, but there is some spread across the state. And then Oklahoma, we understand this spread is because of um, so many of those black towns and enclaves that are really surrounding Tulsa. Um, and so that's something to think about um, when we are looking at these numbers. So here I have, um, this is uh, one of the tables that also came out with this 1910 census that gives you some idea of where black people are living uh, and it is by, um, they have ranked the states. And so in terms of numbers by and far, there are more uh, in 1910, more people of African descent that have been counted for the census in Georgia um, than anywhere else. And then you see the numbers um, uh, in terms of population um, kind of move down from, from those Georgia numbers. And then I split this table up so that I could have it uh, kind of side by side. And what we see here is that somewhere around 16th out of uh, 49 states, we see Oklahoma, this is 1910, we see Kansas here at 24, and we see Nebraska at 33. And, um, and I look at these numbers and I don't think of them as like, these are really low numbers. I look at these numbers like, these are stories of families. <laughs> like, they, like there are 70, uh, I mean, there are 7,000 uh, plus stories of what it was like to be in Nebraska in 1910. There are 54,000 stories of what it was like to be in Kansas uh, and 137 stories of what it was like to be in Oklahoma. And so um, that for me is something that, um, that says that this is work that is still worth pursuing um, because, because we do need to hear those stories. This is just um, different ways in which these numbers have been configured. And I think what I just want people to uh, see is, I want you to see these three states in conjunction with other areas. And I think I'm also thinking about this, like I could see that um, if you, have about 81,000, 82,000 people um, in a place in 1900, and then that number more than doubles, right? So that right there would bring attention. But yet and still, it's still a very small percentage of the population. And so here, if we look at this table, uh, table three, the thing that just kind of struck me is that there's this accumulation of the percentages. And so if you stop right here after the, after the third grouping of states, basically 87% of people of African descent 
live in these states as counted by the census, right? So 87%, so really the remaining 13% of them um, are spread out across these remaining states. And so if we're thinking about like the 13% of the population of um, people of African descent that um, we're not really, we're talking about um, some significant numbers in terms of stories, but um, I, I think in their day and time, they caused a quite a big stir. So I said we were going to bring McKay back again. And in 1890, there is an article that hits one of the Native American territorial papers. It gets picked up on the wire. And then next thing you know, it is running in the New York Times to make a Negro state that the, there is this um, organization that is flowing into Oklahoma that they propose to control the territory. They're demanding equality and a race war is threatened. Now, uh, depending on the accounts that you read, and this article actually goes into more um, more detail, the race war that is threatened is not by um, the black men who are organizing to bring people into the state. It is the um, white people who are uh, around the border of Oklahoma who are threatening to uh, kind of counter migrate, if you will, into the state if black men, Black families um, decide to, um, to uh, continue their migration into the state. Uh, McCabe had had some political success in, in uh, Kansas. And so there was talk of um, if they could get the state if they could get um, Oklahoma, the territories to be um, incorporated into the union, that he might be appointed as the first governor. And, um, but again, the idea of, um, of the aggression behind it is one that is the threat of the increase of numbers um, of that Africanizing the territory. When we see that um, by and large, there's still lots of um, densely populated places in the country uh, and that the territory is not, um, not necessarily that place. Again, going through some of these um, online archives, and I can't wait again to hop on a plane and just sit in the archives um, safely and, uh, and comb through many of these things, um, these documents for myself. But I found this to be very interesting. This is a newspaper uh, front from Oklahoma City. This is the Black Dispatch. And this actually is um, talking about the incident that leads to the destruction of Black Tulsa. And, um, and so we see here that Dick Rowland was the accused young man uh, who by the accounts of black newspapers and, uh, and black residents, they say that he, uh, Dick Rowland, he was a shoe, um, he shined shoes uh, in downtown Tulsa on the white side of Tulsa. And um, he was getting into an elevator and he tripped and um, brushed up against the white elevator operator who's female and um, she kind of shrieked and, um, and then all kinds of assumptions were at work um, that he, he was accused of, um, of trying to rape her. There are no accounts that I found where she actually made the accusation. Um, 
but it was assumed and um, he was um, put in prison or put in jail. And then um, uh, a lynch mob went to go get him out. And this account actually says that um, Dick Rowland, when they went to the prison to lynch him, he wasn't in prison, that he had actually been moved <laughs> to Omaha. And, um, and then he was actually um, released uh, without any charges. And, um, and then it's saying that there is no trace of the, um, of the woman on, um, for whom the allegations were made on her behalf, I think is the best way to say that. But, um, but I just thought that that was interesting. And then just as, a, um, as an, an aside, this Black Dispatch was a newspaper that was put out by um, the Houston family and Drusilla Dungy Houston is um, one of the notable figures in Africana studies for her early work on um, making connections around that long genealogy back to millennia uh, of the story of African people. And so here's this picture of Drusilla Dungy Houston here. And, um, and this is her brother, um, who actually uh, started the newspaper. So I just wanted to, um, to, uh, to put that up. So the thing that kind of gets me started on this journey is the publication of these three novels that was almost like a watershed event. Standing at the Scratch Line gets published in 1997. Uh, Magic City right behind it, and Toni Morrison's Paradise is published in 1998. And all three of these novels in some form or fashion are set uh, in Oklahoma and reference what we know as the All Black Town Movement, or in the case of Jewel Parker Road's Magic City, it is set in Black Tulsa. And you can see here on the cover of the book that this is the fictional character who is based on Dick Rowland. And this is the fictional character who is based on the woman who was the elevator operator. And, um, and this idea of reimagining that moment and what it meant for um, the people who live in Black Tulsa and White Tulsa, um, is what Jewel Parker Rhodes does. Again, Toni Morrison is imagining what is it like for those uh, independent Black towns who are founded by these um, men who are very much like, um, like Benjamin um, Pap Singleton, who uh, start the Exodusters movement out to the Western frontier. And, um, and find that while they were able to maintain it for a generation, um, that increasingly it gets difficult because young people want to move to the cities. Um, we see that um, some reference to this in Magic City, almost like an illusion of how, um, how some of those Black families get there in the first place. And um, that they come to Oklahoma, but then they end up coming to Tulsa um, within one or two generations. And then standing at the scratch line, Guy Johnson, who is the son of uh, poet Maya Angelou, uh, poet, um, autobiographer, actress, activist, Maya Angelou. Um, he is kind of tapping into his own family history a little bit and, um, and reimagining what might be something akin to like a Bowley, Oklahoma, um, and then um, moving further west out to California. And so with these three novels, um, being published around the same time that I am in graduate school, someone kind of pulled my coattail like, have you read that standing um, at the scratch line? And I read it and I really enjoyed it. And then I remembered Magic City 
And, um, and then Paradise comes out. And so um, then I start to put this together um, and start looking for other people who have written about the all black town movement uh, and how it's reimagined and, um, and still kind of looking. Uh, I think I would be remiss if I did not mention, um, I certainly have an interest in terms of all black towns and community formations, but I almost feel like I have to mention Oscar Michaud, who um, certainly um, comes through Chicago and is working as a Pullman porter and actually um, lives a kind of homesteading life in South Dakota. Uh, for a few years, and then he moves back to Chicago, um, and he writes about his experiences. And so, uh, some of his novels have some threads of his own um, autobiographical experience. Um, he wrote several, about seven novels, and um, and then some of his novels were turned into films. And he is mostly known as a just prolific filmmaker, but um, but these first uh, two novels are certainly these ways in which he's weaving that experience that he had in South Dakota, but as a um, uh, uh, kind of like a, uh, like the the lone homesteader, if you will. Um, I wanted to show just a few slides of, um, I mentioned sovereignty, and I also kind of mentioned the, um, the devastation in Tulsa uh, that happens in 1921, but there are also some ways in the popular culture that people are um, kind of working against uh, in terms of this idea of all Black towns. And so, uh, this um, slice of Americana, Courier and Ives, they're actually located in Philadelphia. And they would come, they would distribute these prints. And you see these prints where they're making a mockery. This is called the Dark Town series. And there are more than 20 or so um, prints in the series, and you can see the stereotypical um, kind of animalistic way in which uh, Black people are depicted. And um, there are, I, I tried to pick out just a few of them. This is the next one, which I thought was interesting because we're talking about these homesteaders and these people that are um, basically uh, working and developing this land from nothingness. And, um, and here is um, this very, it was a very popular series that um, of all of the other prints that Courier and Ives produced, that this is one that, um, that people, uh, that uh, a lot of white people wanted to uh, have in their homes uh, and, and just kind of um, like, as I mentioned, these um, frontier identities as professional people, as, as homesteaders, as laborers, that you have this um, slice of Americana that is kind of making a mockery um, of, of their attempts at sovereignty and to govern themselves, and also saying that they're incapable of doing such. Um, this is one that would suggest that um, even the putting out of a fire that um, in a dark town, they would have no idea how to get the people out, how to put the fire out, what to do with the equipment um, and the like. So there was um, certainly active aggression and terrorism, but then there were all these other ways in which the popular culture was saying that um, that this idea of being able to govern um, oneself in a um, in a community that is supposed to um, foster some self determination and safety uh, is is not um, 
that they're not, they're not capable of doing that. Um, I wanted to, um, I'm getting close to ending up, but I couldn't help but pull this up because we're having these conversations again about finding a safe space. And so this is a clip of Freedom Georgia where people have purchased 96 acres of land and they are in the same way in which people moved out to places like Kansas and, um, and Oklahoma and I'm sure Nebraska where they were building like sod houses and um, dugout structures until they could develop the land. These people have um, like, like pup tents um, in the same way. This is the, you know, the 21st century version of, um, of this same kind of impulse to get away from a social structure that is uh, oppressive, is aggressive, and, um, and not a safe place. So now I'm gonna hit this play button once and, uh, and hopefully we won't get the double play like the last time. We are the buying power. If we can just teach each other to circulate our dollars within the community, we will solve our own problems. We are literally the answer to our own problems, but we have to change our thinking and come together. My name is Renee Walters and I am the president of the Freedom Georgia Initiative. I have a black husband, I have a black son. Every time he would leave out for work or just to go to the store or anything, I would have a sense of anxiety just from watching everything that we've been going through lately with the pandemic and watching our black men being murdered on national television in front of everybody. It kind of just all shook us by storm. It's now time for us to get our friends and family together and build for ourselves. That's the only way we'll be safe. That's the only way that this will work. We have to start bringing each other together. Well, we are looking to get amenities on the land. We wanna have a place where you can have weddings, a nice retreat, we'll have tiny homes. We really just want you to come and hang out and feel safe. You don't have to worry about the Karens of the world and anything like that. You just come and have fun. We'll have a sportsman area here with fishing, hunting, shooting range, ATV trails. Um, we really just want to build a tight-knit community for our people to just come and breathe together. I know they have a, a bad stigma that, oh, Black people can't come together. But just like how Black Wall Street, their dollars circulated around 11 times before it left the community. And that's just something we want to bring back. We want to encourage businesses to come. And we want to circulate our dollar within the community before it leaves out to someone else. We want to make everybody in our areas wealthy. Well, every time we go to the land and in the actual cities, like we, we haven't received any backlash. Everyone is really nice and welcoming. It's the internet trolls, the negativity in the world, like, oh, you guys are gonna fail. Isn't this segregation? Uh, this is not what Martin Luther King stood for. And it's not us segregating ourselves. It's just, we're building where we can come and be safe. like. Chinatown has these areas. You go up and down Buford Highway, you can't even read some of the signs because it's not in our language and nobody has a problem. And why is it that when we want to build, we're considered racist or we're segregating ourselves? Why can't we have our own safe haven? Every community has them. Everyone is welcome in freedom. But it is basically based on seeing Black people flourish. And that's all we want because every time we try to, somebody tried to burn it down or we got some type of backlash and I'm just tired of that. It's time for us to build our own. So I wanted to say that because I can't help but think about um, the 24 families 
1910 that moved to DeWitty <laughs> and got 14,000 acres <laughs> um, in Cherry County. And from what I understand, we may have some people, oh, hold on, this, we may have some people that can kind of speak to that experience in, um, in, in, a, in a way that is part of those narratives that I'm really interested in hearing. Um, so I think I'll, I think I'll stop right there, and um, and Deb, if you can kind of come back and let me stop the share. That Did was we... fantastic! Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That that was great, and and I mean I, I had some other questions, but then you brought it all the way back to to what's going on now, and that just kind of like threw me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from Georgia. Yeah. So seeing 85 that, you know, that's, that goes right th through the County where my family's from. And to think about the fact that you had the, in 1910, you had the highest population of blacks in Georgia. And then that people are now saying we can go back and, and create our own, you know, settlement, uh, you know, just reflecting that whole attitude that was happening during the, the Exoduster movement. It's, it's almost like Exodusting in reverse. Yeah. Going back. And a lot of people are doing that, you know, even with the great migration, people are moving back to the South and those lands. Right. Um, but yeah. So I, I do want to kind of bring this discussion to uh, talking about the, the kind of local environment uh, because right now the, library, Chris Library at the University of, of uh, Nebraska, Omaha, has an exhibit, The Descendants of DeWitty, that's on exhibit until November 7th. Um, so in the Osborne Gallery on the main floor. Uh, and before I move forward, I'd like to, to thank uh, Amy Schindler at the library and, and Special Collections and Claire Delaney, who've been so vital to all of this work. Uh, I just really, really want to thank them. Uh, but for right now, I want to bring in a couple of the descendants of DeWitty. So we have uh, Denise Scales and Delbert DeWitty, and I'm promoting them to panelists and hopefully they can get on now. All right. Ms. Scales, how are you? Good, thank you. All right. And there's Mr. DeWitty. You're on mute. <laughs> there you go. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. How's so I just everybody? wanted to uh, let you all have a few words because I mean, this, this, I always say that there are no coincidences. God and the ancestors, when they want some knowledge known, all of the things will come together. So I had already planned for uh, Dr. Adams to, to do this presentation when I found out that the descendants of DeWitty were gonna have an exhibit. And I was like, oh, wow. So we have to have this presentation done during this time while the exhibit's still going on so that people can kind of make that connection but also we want to encourage anybody that's in Omaha to please come and, and look at the exhibit. But uh, I wanted to give you all a, a few minutes to, to kind of talk about how this, this uh, Dr. Adams presentation resonated with what you all know from, from your own family history. Deborah, I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, my my name is Delbert DeWitty, and just coincidentally, I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, so I know all about Black Wall Street. I was actually born in the Black Hospital. Uh, most people don't realize that uh, after the, the massacre, it was actually rebuilt. So, so I grew up in the rebuilt Black Wall Street. Uh, it it has since subsided, uh, but when I grew up, we had bottle pop stations, uh, black hospital, uh, two or three black theaters, uh, and, 
and I went to an all-black high school. So again, as you said, there are no coincidences, and I thought I would just share that with you. Um, we probably don't have a lot of time, so I think I'll just default to Denise, who can actually talk about the descendants of DeWitty and how her family uh, migrated into uh, Nebraska. So with uh, my grandfather uh, was William P. Walker, and he was born in Ohio. Um, he lived with the abolitionists. Uh, the um, 1850 Slave Act happened. They no longer felt free, so they made their way to Canada. Um, and they lived in North Buxton. And after the war was over, they said they wanted to go back home. And so then the Kincaid Act opened in 1904. And so 12 families left North Buxton, Ontario, Canada, and made their way back to Nebraska. And so they settled in Nebraska in 1880 in Overton, uh, Nebraska. And then when the Kincaid Act offered another uh, 640 acres of land, that's when they moved over into the Sand Hills, where they, which is called DeWitty. And I'll let Delbert tell the story about DeWitty. <laughs> okay, so uh, my ancestor, uh, Miles DeWitty, uh, was actually the first postmaster. And uh, when he registered the town, uh, I guess he had a little ego. He, he registered it in, in his name. So that's how it became to be DeWitty, Nebraska. And just a side note, I'd never heard of DeWitty, Nebraska. Quite frankly, I'd never heard of Miles. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, is Bryson DeWitty, who is Miles's brother. So I actually saw the dedication of the signage on Facebook. And that's when I went up to investigate it. So that's when I actually found out about Miles DeWitty. So <clears throat> our family is originally from Barbados and we moved from Barbados to Texas. Uh, so Miles's father, Moses, uh, actually moved uh, to right outside of Austin, Texas. And, uh, and we've got a, a long, strong family history there. Uh, but but uh, Miles had the pioneer spirit and uh, he left uh, because of the Kincaid Act and moved up to uh, Nebraska uh, to, to take advantage of that. And I am always amazed, and I'm not sure how many people know, how many families was it, Denise? There was like over 100, right? I think there's like 176 uh, families in on the Black um, settlement in DeWitty. So that to me is just fascinating. And they came from all over the country. So, uh, so Denise and I are just two of those 126 families, 176, I'm sorry, families that actually migrated to DeWitty, Nebraska. So there's a lot more work that actually we would like to do to, to reach out and attract those families and get them involved in our organization of descendants of DeWitty. Yes, yeah, so our organization was founded in 2016 after the, uh, what is it, the um, Nebraska, uh, what is it, the Nebraska Historical Society uh, recognized the De Witty as a historical site and they put a, um, a, a marker on Highway 86 to um, show the significance of um, DeWitty and the breath. And that's when we started a, a nonprofit. And so we're like five years young. And so we have a um, traveling photo exhibit with live um, reenactors. Um, we have a 22 piece exhibit for uh, museums and small uh, venues. Uh, we also have a uh, eight minute uh, video presentation on the Humanities Nebraska website. We also created a lesson plan for fourth, fifth and sixth graders that includes the teacher's guide. And um, we also um, submitted a play. So we also want this to make it to the state. We wanna also be the next Hamilton, but it'll be the Walkers and the Dewitty. <laughs> I will see that. I yeah. will see that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we've done over the uh, past five years. 
Wow. That's a lot that you've done in five years. I mean, I'm just amazed at how many different places that you um, that you touched on um, from Canada to Barbados and right. Texas and, and Oklahoma. And, and they uh, even mentioned that uh, North Buxton was an all-Black settlement in Ontario. Yes, yes. and it still exists today. Yes. Um, every year in September, they have a week-long celebration, and they honor all the um, Black people who made their way into Canada. So I have I met my relatives there for the first time in 2018. Didn't know I had them. But they you know, there. this year was... Um, was it August? No, it's, it was September that they celebrated yes. Emancipation Month. I mean, Emancipation Day for an entire month in Canada. Okay. And so it was like they were encouraging it to be like a countrywide celebration that, um, you know, individuals used to do kind of like we do Juneteenth. You know, we kind of do our own celebrations and they were trying to do something that was a, a lot larger in scope. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm i I'm blown away. I got a question for you. I'm wondering how did DeWitty get changed to Audacious? Well, he moved. <laughs> uh, he, he moved and left and went to uh, California. OK. Uh, and then when he left, they decided to change the name. And they said they were an audacious set of folks. So they thought audacious actually exemplified their spirit more. Yes. I love it. I knew there was a story behind it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I just, um, I just feel so full hearing about your stories and, um, and just excited about the people that are going to find you all um, to help you fill in that um, that tree. My students are doing similar work um, in trying to think about their families. And, um, and sometimes I told them it's just good to write it down right. so that even if other people have to come in and add to it, you know, that at least you've, you've left the record of what you know. Right. Right. So nobody has to has to reinvent that wheel. So thank you so much. I'm glad some of them are here hearing this because <laughs> I think sometimes they think I'm giving them work for work's sake. <laughs> like, well, you know, Catherine, and, and so your students that are still here, we're going to try to have a, a panel on the Great Plains and have some of the descendants of DeWitty for the Malcolm X Festival happening in the spring. So yeah, so we hope to be able to have a, a you know, a large in-depth discussion, yeah. you know, on this. Wow. Ooh, we'll be there. That's yes. So this was just, this was so amazing. So I really want to thank you all. Uh, you all are helping us to, to kick off our 50th in a, in a great way. Uh, I was trying to get Dr. Robinson to come on and say hello, but she said to just give her say hello for her <laughs> that she didn't need to come on. Uh, Dr. Harbour, she had to leave early, but she said to, to thank you, uh, Catherine. She said it was fascinating to hear the intersection of history and literature. Uh, so yes, it was just an amazing, amazing night. I just wanna thank all of you. Uh, and I want to let you all know about our next event, which will be happening on Tuesday. And I'm going to uh, show our little slide, and that's not that one. Um, go over to the next one. This is, panel is in the way. I can just move this share panel that's in my way. There we go. So um, next Tuesday will be Dr. Uh, Imani, who's a faculty member, professor of black studies. Uh, his lecture will be on Mayat Blinded. So Mayat is the Egyptian goddess. It's also uh, a word and a concept. Maya 
means to be true, to be just. Mayat is the concept and it's also the name for the goddess. But uh, the concept of Mayat means uh, truth, justice, right dealing, fairness, all of those things are encompassed in the concept of Mayat. Uh, so his lecture, Mayat Blinded, Africana Views on the Challenge of the Loss of Shame for the Individual and the Community. So that'll be at three o'clock on Tuesday. So you all are more than welcome. Uh, all of these will be recorded and will show up on our website uh, probably the day after. But uh, yeah, so again, I want to thank all of you. Thank Dr. Adams, Ms. Scales, Mr. DeWitty, all of our audience. Uh, we have family from Chicago, I see that are on. Uh, all of the people from Claflin that are visiting you in Omaha. We had, I think, someone from, from the University of Nebraska from Lincoln. But just for all of you, want to thank you and wish you all a good night. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Thank Mr. Gales. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dan.